Hi, guys. I just turned to Jasmine over there, and I was like, it's amazing how many times you can sing in front of people, but then you speak in front of people, and it's like, oh, Holy Spirit, help me. <laughs> no, I'm excited. I'm excited to be with you guys and talk about, we're going to talk about being rooted in God. So I'm just going to pray really quick. Lord, I just thank you for this group of people. I thank you for who is in this room right now, that you have brought them here for this time. And I just ask that everything you have to be imparted to them would not just hit the surface, but go deep. We just ask just for the soil of our hearts to be so rich and open to you, Jesus. God, just tear down every wall, any wall that anyone walked in this room with. We just say, Holy Spirit, destroy it. God, open our hearts in a new way. We didn't even know we could open them to you. Lord, we just ask that every word spoken, what's of you, just pierce our hearts in Jesus' name. God, help me not go on a million bunny trails like I do all the time, but help us just have fun if I do, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about being rooted in God, which is a very broad topic, but we're going to go through a few little just biblical things and culture pieces of what that means, what that looks like, what does it look like to live our lives rooted in God, following the Spirit. I'm going to share literally a little bit of my story. So my name is Lindy. I am seven months pregnant, just started, yes. Uh, third trimester began yesterday, so that's exciting. In 2007, I graduated high school, and I was very curious about who God was. I wasn't totally, I was born and raised in the Bible Belt, so I knew about God. I basically believed in Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. Had a great family, but I had no revelation of the love of God or the cross. So my concept of God was don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, love God, go, don't go to hell. It's just so like no revelation, no love of God. And so what happened was when I was a junior in high school, I just, I was really intrigued with traveling. So I asked my parents, hey, can I go on like some random missions trips? So I did <laughs> like with any, like I went on one mission trip with like Church of Christ. I was like, oh, you guys don't believe in instruments. Cool, that's, that's cool. Like I had no idea. Like I was just so, I had something in me that wanted to travel. Now I look back and I go, that was the Holy Spirit provoking something inside of me. But at the time I was just going, I love to travel. I wanna go with these churches to different places. And I remember one of the churches I went with, they were going door to door preaching the gospel, which when you don't really have a revelation of the love of God and the cross and you know what we've been rescued from, it's kind of hard to preach the gospel. But I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna go. And I went up to this lady, she was like covered in flies, looked like she, I mean, she was so sick, could hardly move. And I looked at her, I'm like, do you know Jesus? And she looked back at me with these piercing blue eyes and said, do you know Jesus? And I was like, no, I don't actually. <laughs> this is embarrassing, you know. I was like, oh my goodness. And it struck me that this woman, literally in a moment, this woman who had every right to be offended at God, not love Jesus, to go, why am I in the situation I am in extreme poverty, and looked at me with these piercing blue eyes and I saw an eternal joy that I was like, that's the God I wanna find. That's the God I wanna serve. And that is what I knew was real and I've been searching for it. And this one moment with this lady changed my life and I went home and I Googled mission school and YWAM was the first thing that came up. And that's literally how I got to YWAM. There's, there was nothing really complicated about that. Praise God for Google. And so in 2007, I went to the YWAM base in Kona, Hawaii. Anyone in here done YWAM before? Awesome. Very cool. And I had no idea my whole life was about to be flipped upside down. Not only did I encounter the power of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, but I encountered a love that was so consuming, so real. It changed everything. And I remember sitting there going, wait a minute, like I've been around people who know this and no one told me. Like I've, I've known people who have had a revelation of this kind of love and no one told me. And it's like, I finally understood evangelism. I finally understood why we take up our cross and follow. Everything made sense when I encountered the love of the cross, the love of the father. And I just, I, I went, 
it all makes sense now. Like that I would want to take up my cross and follow him, that I would want to count it all as lost for the surpassing worth of just knowing Jesus. And I went, he is, his love really is better than life. All these scriptures I'd learned in Sunday school, it's like the Holy Spirit went and they all came alive. And I went, the word is living and it's active and it's dividing soul and spirit and I'm feeling all this now. And it's like I rose up, I really had a salvation encounter. And I remember in that moment going, what? I'm on my discipleship training school, it's like week three, and all I could think was, if this is, if this is how it really is, what is it gonna be like 10 years from now? What's it gonna be like 20 years from now? And I begin to dream about what could life with God actually look like? Like, this is crazy. And so I begin to open my scripture and words that Paul said suddenly made sense and all this stuff. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is so wild. I'm like, Lord, how did I not know? How did I not know? And I just begin to burn like, this all makes sense and no man could have done this. No person could have forced me into it, but it's the Holy Spirit revealed Jesus to me through, through this amazing ministry, through people. And then it was actually in Kona where we all got introduced to like Bethel and then IHOP and we were all like, what is this? This is crazy. Like it just felt like we're living in one of the most beautiful times on earth in between. I love to think of it like this. We have the privilege to be one of the generations of many that will live in between the first and second coming of Jesus, filled with his Holy Spirit, filled with the promise of God and being able to take the gospel wherever we go. Whether that means to the ends of the earth or to your next door neighbor, it's all the same to Jesus. It's all about obedience and knowing his voice and being rooted in him and obeying him. So we're gonna hop in really quick. The first thing of being rooted in God that I learned so quickly is understanding his lordship and the joy of his lordship. So sometimes I feel like that's a lost art almost in the church. Like we don't want to, I don't want to be controlled. I don't want someone to tell me what to do. I don't want to do that, you know, but it's like the beauty of his lordship is God at the center of it all. That it's, it's when Jesus is in the garden, and he says, Father, let this cup pass for me, but nonetheless, not my will, but yours be done. He understood the Father God, but as a Lord, he was the Lord of his life. And there is a joy, there is an eternal joy that wells up when you know his Lordship is for our good. His Lordship is for our freedom, not for us to be sad or like, well, He's the Lord of my life, and I guess God's just a controlling God up there. No, no, no. He's the Lord. He's like, there's this beauty. It's, you know, when Mary, the mother of Jesus, finds out she's pregnant, she's young, she's not married. Every reason in the world to want to say, please don't pick me. I'm terrified. I'm going to get rejected. No one's going to want to talk to me. I'm not married, and now you're telling me I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And you don't see, like, the following scripture isn't like, and then she responded in tons of unbelief and spewed out a bunch of cuss words to God because she wasn't sure what was going on and got really offended at God, but Jesus came anyways. No, she says, I'm a bondservant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And I remember the first time I read that, I was like, that is crazy. Like if you really think about the situation she was in, that she would rise up and say, I'm a bond servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. I went, that is the beauty of lordship is trust, is trusting God. And so we know being rooted in God, trust is the key to being rooted in God. Um, so Jeremiah 17, seven through eight Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be, they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes and its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never, never fails to bear fruit. And I'm like, whew, okay, so when I started really praying into God, what does it look like to be rooted in you? What does it look like to know you and, and live my life in that way? I really started thinking it is all about trust because it's only in the moments in my life where I stop trusting God that I feel like 
okay, something just knocked me over. Like, uh, this isn't about perfection or striving or, listen, being rooted in God is all about doing it perfectly. No, no, no. Being rooted in God is about being able to stand in the wind and the waves. And we all know, we're just going to read this really quick in James. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith, we all know it produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you, be, you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So that brings us back double-minded. When we, when God is not at the center and something else is, it's an open gate to anxiety. It's an open gate to depression. It's an open gate. Guys, I have struggled with anxiety. I have struggled with depression, I have had moments where I have literally feel like I'm the woman grabbing the hem of his garment saying, I have to know it's gonna end. I have to know it's gonna end. Are you here with me? Where are you? I'm so anxious. I feel like panic attacks are just creeping down my back and I'm fighting and I'm fighting and I'm fighting and I'm fighting and I have to know, where are you? Where are you? And that's why I started crying during Callie's song because he's like, I'm right in the middle of it. I am right here. I need you to turn to me. I need you to turn and see that I'm here. And sometimes it's our own unbelief and we don't even realize it that is keeping us from the very living God that's surrounding us, that's right there. So when, when we're talking about being rooted in God, we have to be aware of the, the trap of unbelief. If we are not aware of the trap of unbelief, you will be led down a road of unbelief. You have to understand how it works, how it seeks to destroy. Because, I mean, I talked about this in the breakout session earlier. I always thought it's so crazy to me how the Israelites could see water split with their own eyes. They're running and they see literally an ocean split and they walk through it. And still after that, they doubted God. Still after that, and I'm like, I would never doubt God if I saw that. I would never have unbelief if I saw something like that. That is so crazy and so wild. I would never question if God was real ever again. Yet now I can look at so many areas in my life where I've done that very thing. And so I really believe what God is doing in this hour is he's raising up his bride to understand how unbelief has come to seek and destroy. And he is giving the gift of faith in this hour. And he's giving the gift of being able to see how God sees. Does this make sense? Yes. Come on. And so, of course, we know being rooted in God, that is a, a beautiful thing. But it has so much also to do with the secret place and pursuing Jesus it's, you know, we live in a generation now where it's really easy to look at the fruit and compare and fall into the trap of comparison. And we don't understand the roots that have to go down in history with God, in intimacy with God, in prayer with God for, for something beautiful to spring up. Do you know what I mean? So often we just want, we want what's on the fruit that comes out. We want to see something big grow, but we don't want to do the work and go deep with God. We don't want to have a consistent prayer life. We don't want to be in the word. We don't want to have to evangelize. No way. I just, Lord, I just know it's my time to have the microphone. You, you gave me this word. I don't know why I'm not there yet. And we start to wrestle with God and God's like, I want you. I want your heart. I want to make you like me more than anything. He's not concerned about when he wants to open up favor on your life. That's the least of his concern. So it shouldn't be our concern. Does that make sense? So, yeah, amen. Thank you, God. I, I got so tested in this season because I always dreamed of being a mom. I mean, that was like my... I remember being young, when I was 10 years old, my sister was born and it was like a dream come true. Cause I was like, now I'm like 10 and I get to have my own little baby. Like it was just like awesome. I loved it and I was like, I can't wait to be a mom. Like I thought I'd go to YWAM, get married at 19 and just have kids. I was not a worship leader when I went to YWAM. I did not lead worship. 
Well, what happened was, is I went to YWAM, I encountered God, and I wanted to go to unreached people groups and be a hardcore missionary. Well, at the same time, God called a man and a woman named Andy and Holly Bird to Kona to pioneer the house of prayer. And I was like, what's house of prayer? This is before I knew about IHOP. Do you live in a house and pray? And they said, no, here's what it is. God's bringing worship back into missions, and he's going to restore the beauty of, of the, just, you know, why we was founded on prayer and worship and that being the fuel of missions. And the Lord was infusing YWAM again with, with worship, just radical worship to Jesus, like no agenda, just Let's do this. Let's see how of prayer infused the missions movement. And so basically, if you were in YWAM and you could hold a note, you were on the worship team. So that's what happened to me is I was like, great. And then next thing happens is suddenly now I'm leading worship. You know, I'm leading my own sets. And I'm like, okay, well, I should start learning keys because honestly, it's just too hard for me to like, I'll feel a moment and the person playing's not feeling it. So I disciplined myself to learn an instrument it's because I was like, I, I could feel, I got to steward something that's happening, but I don't really know what's happening. Does that make sense? So I just remember going, all right, and then one thing led to another, and now all of a sudden I'm leading worship here and, and then there, and then now I'm invited here, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, time out, time out, time out. I, I, I wasn't like trying to be a worship leader, you know, but then the Lord began to speak to me about how he wants to use the power of worship and music all across the earth to bring people to him. And it was this heart I had for, for evangelism and seeing people know him. Like I came to know him and I went, okay, if you want to use worship, then I'll surrender my life to this. So then for the next 10 years, it was just full on. I mean, seeing the beauty of worship rise up in nations and being able to travel and, and you know, it, it just blew my mind when I could have never dreamed of this. And then, you know, I get my husband and I, we got married in 2016. We were both in circuit riders loving it. And then the Lord just crashes in and we begin to have dreams about adoption and foster care. And we're like, yes, like to the least of these, let's go. Like, let's take every kid. And so then like, you know, we're like, let's do it. And so we get a call for a baby and we drive to the hospital and we get a baby and we're like, yes, like adoption movement, foster care movement, let's go, church rise up. And then suddenly now we can't travel anymore because we have to get state approval to leave the state. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. what? I was like, um, excuse me? And then a month later, I'm like, I feel really weird. I feel like sick all the time and I don't know what's wrong with me and Chase is on a trip and I was like, I'm just gonna take a pregnancy test because I know I'm not pregnant, but I just need to really know for myself, I'm alone right now. And so I take the pregnancy test and it's like clearly two lines. I didn't read the box. So I was like, whew, we're not pregnant. <laughs> I was like, praise God. I was like, this is, I am so grateful. Like. But Lord, if you wanted to give us a life, I would have also been grateful. But I really didn't feel like it was time. So thank you, Lord, you know. And like three hours goes by and then I read the box and I was like, oh, two lines. Okay, I'm gonna take another one just in case. I was like, okay. And so then it's like two lines and I'm like, I have a one month old, Lord. Where are you? Do you see this? Like, huh? And so, I remember I called Chase. He was in Florida on Carry the Love, which is our campus. Yeah, have you, raise your hand if Carry the Love came to your school at one point. Amazing, God is moving on college campuses. It's awesome. So Chase is on Carry the Love, he's in Florida. I call him, I'm like, hey, are you alone? And if you know anything about Carry the Love, it's a very unglamorous tour. And what I mean is we're in like 15 passenger vans and if we've run out of vans, then we're borrowing cars from people driving campus to campus, and it's amazing, with a U-Haul full of a very interesting sound system. Um, so we bless the Lord, though, because he moves even in the midst of ghetto stuff, because he's God, <laughs> and he can do anything, okay? So Chase is on Carry the Love. I'm like, hey, are you, are you alone? He's like, no, I'm in a two-hour drive right now, like from campus to campus. I'm like, Oh, so you're gonna be in the car a while? He's like, yeah. I'm like, are you driving? He's like, no. I'm like, all right, well, I just, just call me when you get to your next location. I gotta just tell you something. 
But I was like, I'm just gonna text him. I, I can't wait. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I literally took a picture of the pregnancy test and I sent it to him and he was like, are you serious? Did you just text this to me? And I was like, yeah, I did. I absolutely did. Um, and I was like, but I called to make sure you weren't driving, so I love you. Um, <laughs> like, okay. And so, it, you know, we were in this like amazing, it's like this new season hit us and it was just incredible. We're like, all right, it's time to do family. It's time to embrace not just, because if you know anything about foster care, you're, you're also embracing birth parents, which is one of the most beautiful things. And I had to learn that to go, man, I'm gonna love this baby with all my heart, but I'm gonna also embrace your birth parents and believe for their healing and deliverance. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's wild, but it's so good. So here we are. And you know, like now a few weeks have gone by. I'm like, wow, like I just feel like such a hardcore American missionary that we're running into the foster care system. Oh my goodness, you know, kind of like trying to give myself a pump up speech. But deep down I was feeling like, oh, I just ruined my calling. I am not gonna be able to do what I feel like I've been able to do. And I'm just being real with you guys because I'm like, he is real, he's alive. And being rooted in God is not just a good Christianese, like be rooted in God, you better do that. It's like, it will save your life. It will save your life because when you are driven by your outcomes and what people see, it will destroy you. It will destroy you. And so I remember, I didn't know how to communicate. I'm like, I don't even know how to say right now that I'm starting to feel like depressed and I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, we went from being able to just kind of freely flow and see God do all these amazing things to I have to be so intentional with in a totally different way now. I can't just do what I've always done and how I've known God in that context. Like I know God, like I know how to meet him on airplanes. I love touching the soil of new nations and going, what do you wanna do here? Who are the people you wanna touch? And it was like my, I felt like my relationship with God just got shaken in such a radical way. This is December, January, February of this year. It's not that long ago. And I'm still walking through it, so I'm not like, I made it. Um, it but I, I, it, it confronted in me where I had been rooting myself in outcome, where I had been rooting myself in what other people thought based on what I can do. And I went, and I remember I had the moment where I stopped and I went, this might be the greatest gift. These two babies might be the greatest gift because they're anchoring me back in the secret place like I didn't know I strayed from. Does that make sense? It's like sometimes we can like, you just are a little off, but a long way down the road, it's a lot off. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's one of the most beautiful, humbling things to sit and go, okay, I've been a little bit outcome driven because I, and it's, it's, I felt like it was always from a pure place. Like I love seeing God move. So it, God's not up there mad like you finally got it. You know, he's like, oh, I've been, I've been drawing you in through every circumstance. I've been drawing you in through every yes. And it just wrecked me because I went, you want my heart more than you want my good deeds or what I can do for you. You know, it's the greatest fruit you will see is when you abide in the vine, is when you are with him. Okay, we're gonna keep going here. Um, four things that you have to plant yourself in. I touched on this in the beginning is the love of God. If you do not understand the all-consuming, fiery love that God has for you, you will be in ruts. You will be trying to figure out, you'll be trying to fill that void with other things, whether it be like, I need to have enough money, I need to be in these certain relationships, I need to know these people, I need to align myself with this leader. I, you know, it's like all the weird things we do as humans when we feel like, 
oh, I, I have a void right now I need to fill. And that void will only be found in the love of God, in the truth of Jesus, in the power of the gospel. I love what Paul says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power to save. It's the power to heal. It's the power to deliver. And I think as worshipers and musicians, that's what God is marking us with in this hour is a fresh revelation of the power of the gospel to say, listen, we are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of the truth of the living, breathing God. Jesus is the only way to God. And the wages of our sin was death. And Jesus broke onto the scene and said, you are mine. And I'm taking you back. And I'm giving my life to take you back. And there's no greater love than this, than one who would lay down his life for his friends. And that's our Jesus. And that's the love we have to plant our lives in. Is a beautiful, sacrificial, all-consuming love. Um, the second thing, you have to plant yourself in the word of God. I know that's been, I've heard that so many times already being up here, is the word of God really is life. And I'm just going to be so honest. I live in Southern California where people are making up stuff about God and just saying, hey, it's true. And I'm like, no, it's not. Um, but bless you. And you know why I can confidently in my heart go, it's not true? is because I believe this book. I, but so you gotta ask yourself, I, if you, and if you are right now, I'm dead serious. If you're in a place where you're like, I don't know, I've read some books that have like tested the legitimacy of the Bible, and I'm just trying to figure out for myself if the Bible's true, um, I would really encourage you to get alone with God tonight and, and just resolve that with Him. <laughs> Because this book is true, and it's life, and it's life to your bones. It's, it is the living word. That's why I share that part of my testimony, is because I knew mostly dead religion most of my life. Yeah. Do this right. Do this. Don't do this wrong. And you'll be with Jesus forever. And it was no one's heart. It was just, there was just not the revelation there. And so I remember going, this book's alive. And it was almost scary. I'm like, <gasps> like scriptures are coming to life. Like this is a living, this is not, it is words on a page, but it's like, it's like the most supernatural, beautiful explosion of love, faith, and truth you can have an encounter with. And I know this because I feel I have felt this so many times as a worship leader. There is a war to keep you out of this book. There, what Benny's talking about, the spiritual realm, there is a war to keep you out of it. You will have times and seasons where you need to fight through the resistance to not get in the word. And I just I say that so humbly because I've experienced it. Where I've gone, mo I've, I've literally have gone chunks of time where I've gone, oh, I haven't been in the word. I'm being raw with you because like I have to be raw. So you don't, so you don't think it's like, man, I, I can't relate. No, let's relate. I have had seasons where I'm like, I feel like I just can't open the book. And you know what? I'm just going to put on some worship music and soak. And, you know, God's with me. So I'm basically like in communion with him all day, every day. So I'm good. It's fine. I don't need to read my Bible. And I remember it was actually, I think we were with our friend Ben Fitzgerald. And he mentioned like, I feel like there's such a war over worship leaders just getting the word. And I was like, oh my. <laughs> You're right. I was like, I have felt this like weird resistance to getting in my Bible. And it's like I had to open my eyes and see like, oh, I got to overcome this. And I got to get in the word. Okay. Second thing. Uh, so the love of God was the first one, the word of God. They delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. A fun thing, this is what I've started doing every day is I'm singing through the Psalms right now. So I sit at my piano, I sing through the Psalms, and if there's one part that sticks out to me, I'll sing it till I can memorize it. And it seems so mundane, but it has so helped fuel like my, my daily just life in the word and understanding who God is and letting it sink in. So if you need to find creative ways, find creative ways. Like that's what I had to do. I just go, I'm gonna, dis I'm gonna discipline myself to sing the Psalms every day in this season because I need to take back what the enemy just tried to steal. And for me, it was this passivity towards the word. So, um, all right, so the word of God. And then the third thing you have to plant yourself in is the work of Christ. That's very tied with the love of God, but it's understanding the work that was finished on the cross. 
and also understanding the work of Christ, understanding the life of Jesus and rooting yourself in that. How did he relate to people? How did Jesus talk to people? When did he step out? When did he go away with the Father? Study his life. Look at his life. Um, Colossians 2, 6 through 7 says, just as you accepted Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. That's 2 Corinthians 2, 6 through 7, if you want to write it down. Okay, the fourth thing you have to plant yourself in, and this was, you know, it said this in the Jeremiah scripture, is you have to plant yourself in the confidence of the Lord knowing who God is. One of my favorite scriptures that even recently, I feel like our community in Circuit Riders has been going through the Gospels, and it's just like re-wrecking my life. I'm like, there's just so much. It's like an endless well of, of wildness, the Bible. So when Jesus is, he, you know, he's looking at his disciples, and he's like, who do you say I am? And he's like, well, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist. And he's like, no, no, but who do you say I am? And Peter's like, well, oh, you're Christ's son, the living God. Jesus is like, only the Father in heaven revealed this to you, and you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. And I, I, as I was praying into this session and praying into what God wanted to say, I just went, man, is that such a beautiful picture of knowing God and in that place where the, only the Father could have revealed to Peter who Jesus truly was. And he said, no, you are Christ's son, the living God. And then Jesus is like, I am, and this is who you are. You have to believe who God says you are. If you do not believe who God says you are, you will be at a war within yourself until you do. And it's not pride, it's, it's false humility to go, I think God said this, but not me. God wouldn't pick me. Uh, God wouldn't wanna use me that way. That is the snare and the trap of unbelief and how it wants to come in and make us half-hearted in everything we do, which then brings us back to that scripture in James, double-mindedness. When you are double-minded, it means you literally are serving two things. You are two things you're serving. And so it's like, are you going to bow down to fear or bow down to the all-consuming, reckless love of God and listen to who he says you are? And this isn't just like a, you know, sometimes this can sound so Christianese, like, believe who God says you are. (laughs) Amen. But it's like, no, there is a deep well in the voice of God. He wants to speak to you. Why? Because that's how he made you, with his very breath. His very breath cause you to have life. So it's his very breath that will give you life now. It's his very breath that will be the living water to you right now. Um, So those, I'm gonna say these four things again. Plant yourself in the love of God, the word of God, the work of Christ, and plant yourself in the confidence of the Lord. Here are four other things. These are just four pillars. This is, I'm going so simple right now. I had a dream one time, and in the dream, all these riots were breaking out, and chaos was breaking out, and I hadn't, I didn't live in Los Angeles yet, but we were on outreach in Los Angeles when I had this dream. I was still living in Kona at the time, and I remember all, like, it was just pure chaos breaking out, and this, I don't know, it wasn't any person I knew, but I knew it was a group of Christians. They said, Everybody run, chaos is breaking out. And I remember in the dream I said, chaos is breaking out. No, 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 we have the kingdom. We should be running into this chaos to bring the kingdom. And I said this in the dream. And then literally uh, this, this spirit walks up to me in the, the dream and says, no, don't run into the chaos. Don't you remember what happened to Esther and Deborah? They died. And I said, no, they didn't. They delivered a nation when they ran into the chaos. And I said, if I live, I live. If I die, I die. Whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord's. And it caused, it bound the spirit in the dream. And I went, oh my goodness. And then I said out loud, the key is simplicity, simplicity. And I woke up and I went, whoa, 
Like the enemy tries to come at us with confusion and complication when it's all so simple. It's all so simple that it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's no longer, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And so we have to tear down these false ideologies of fear and unbelief that have been trying to take our generation by storm. It's like, it, you know what I mean? It's like the biggest crisis is unbelieving believers. Like, if we will just believe who God says he is and rise up, I'm telling you, we would be in so much more peace and rest than we could even dream of. And I'm like, these are the days we're living in. This is what the earth is longing for and groaning for, is you to believe who God says you are. You have to. You have to. There's no, the only other option is you trying to figure it out for the rest of your life. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and having a war inside while you do it. So these, this is what I call four pillars of simplicity. When you're just like, I feel stuck in a rut. Ask yourself this. Are you having worship? Are you worshiping God alone? Are you sitting with him, adoring him? And then is your life, it's, and we all know worship's more than a song. We see that in Romans 12. We know that with Abraham sacrificing his son. And see, that was the first time the Hebrew word worship is mentioned. It's in the context of obedience, which is such a reflection of Romans 12. Come on. We know worship. It's, you know, that, that obedience was a song, the one we did. It was, I just had been groaning of like, God, I want to try to put this Romans 12 and this, this passage in Genesis into song, like how, that we'll love you with our yes and obedience. It's not just about like a good melody or a good this or that, but it's like all my life. So are you worshiping? Is your life in a place of worship? Number two, are you praying? <laughs> like what Benny said, it's, you know, if we were to ask, if I were to ask, what's your prayer life like? You know, you'd be like, I need to pray more. And I so, when she said that, I'm like, yeah, that's honestly probably what I would have said. Uh, I need to pray more. If Benny Johnson was asking me, how's your prayer life? I'd be like, not like yours. Yours is amazing. <laughs> Um, but it's, no, again, don't compare. Lord, I'm not comparing. Um, but prayer, and it is just talking to God. And if you are that way, you're going, man, I need to improve my prayer life. Just start once a day with going, Lord, give me something to pray for. All right, I'm going to pray for these unreached people groups every day for a week. But prayer. So worship, prayer, the word, and sharing the gospel. So many of us are robbed of touching a place of the heart of God because we've never shared the gospel. We've never freely given what we've been given. And there is something beautiful about living a lifestyle of letting God move through your life in a prophetic way, in whatever way he's leading you. But I would encourage you, if you've never prayed for someone or shared the gospel with someone, just to step out and do it. And so this is what I just call, it's like the four pillars of simplicity. Worship, prayer, the word, sharing the gospel. We are out of time. Um, can I go like 30 more seconds? Is that okay? That's okay? Okay. Um, I just prayed and I felt like, you know, in my own life, I, I have areas of unbelief that creep in. And I just was praying for you guys last night. I called one of our beautiful leaders, and I said, will you pray with me? And she was like, let's do it. And I was like, I want to get real, like, what is God saying to you guys about where unbelief has tried to come in and where we can identify it in our lives and overcome? And I just felt the first thing is unbelief that God will only move when I perform. And not really resting in the finished work of the cross of, like, I'm an empty vessel. God, you have to move. The second one is unbelief in how I will get what God has declared over my life. How do I get from point A to point B and not believing God will do it? Number three, unbelief through our own self-imposed limitations. I can't write, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. If you, if you find yourself saying that a lot, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, you have to stop and reel it in and go, no, 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 no. I'm not doing that anymore, I can. God's called me, I can, God's called me. The fourth one is unbelief that hinders initiation. Maybe you felt to initiate to co-write with someone in your church, but you're like, oh, I'm just not good. Or uh, initiating, uh, like taking lessons or learning a new instrument. I know that seems silly, but sometimes we don't, we don't understand there's a stronghold, which 
Stronghold, that word stronghold is very simple. It's something that has a strong hold on your mind and it causes you to think not clearly. And so I just feel like these areas of unbelief, if we can just stand up, we're just gonna pray that the Holy Spirit would remove all hindrance of unbelief. Um, the last thing is I just feel like there's a few areas of passivity that the Lord wants to deal with in our hearts. The first one is selective obedience, willing to do some things but not others. I like this stuff Jesus said, but not really this stuff. We need to like bulldoze that out of our lives and say, no way, I'm all in, Jesus. The second one is relying on what I know without pressing in for it. Sometimes I've done this. This is literally out of my own experience. Because we're singing songs, sometimes it's a little bit less preparation than maybe doing a whole message. And we can coast and rely on maybe one thing we've learned. And the Lord's saying, no, 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 I need you to dive in. You can't rely on what you just know without pressing in for it. And so we have to break. And it's not... You understand this is not you, I'm not looking at you guys saying you're dealing with this. I'm saying I believe there are assignments that God wants to break, that the enemies tried to come with unbelief and passivity over creatives. I feel like it's an age old thing and there is a level of passivity that God's gonna break today. The third one is deferring to others. So either because you see them as more qualified or you're avoiding the situation. You can't like, there is something about just like, it, it, Jesus came to serve, not to be served. What does it look like for you to serve where you're at and not have entitlement to position? Do you know what I mean? You might have a position and that's beautiful. And if God's elevating you in that way, receive it, accept it, run with it, but don't be entitled to it. And then the fifth one is delay. Knowing God's asked you to do something and go, oh, I'll do that when, I'll do that when. Uh, when, you know, I'm married. I'll do that when I'm married. Or I'll do that, da 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 And we, we back away, we shy away from what God's saying, and we delay because we don't want to press in. Does this make sense? So if you can do this, I'm going to do, it might be a little bit funny, but I just believe there is corporate, just something beautiful when we pray together. So I'd call it, it's called the four R's. <laughs> Literally, we're going to repent. We're gonna rebuke the enemy, we're gonna replace it with faith, and we're gonna receive God's forgiveness. So, yes, just repeat after me. Just say, Jesus, Jesus I, repent I repent for all unbelief, for all unbelief. In, Jesus name, in Jesus' name, right now, right now I, receive I receive faith, faith. Wild, faith. wild faith, hit my heart, hit my heart. right now. Jesus name. Jesus name and I rebuke, and I rebuke the, enemy the enemy and every assignment, and every assignment to, slow to slow me down and blind me and, blind me and deceive me. And Jesus, Jesus I, receive I receive your forgiveness, your forgiveness. and I love you. Jesus name. In Jesus name. So one more thing, just say unbelief. unbelief. Get, off. Get off. My generation. My generation. In, Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Awesome.